everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thanks to the festival for uh, allowing us to have this conversation um, and to all of you here. Uh, my name is Camille Ice. I'm the Chief of Global Partnerships and Policy at the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, otherwise known as OCCRP. Uh, we're a global network of investigative journalists that works cross-border to expose crime and corruption so the public can hold power to account. Um, today, our topic of conversation uh, is looking at non-traditional partnerships uh, and specifically how they can accelerate the impact of reporting. Um, this has been uh, a bigger conversation uh, in this festival, which we're uh, excited to see, specifically the question of journalists and advocates working together. Um, this has been something that traditionally is against the rules for journalists, um, but what we're here to do in this uh, discussion today is to look at two real-world models, two initiatives um, that have brought these uh, different groups together um, and to specifically look at how they've made a difference. What has it meant um, for the change that, that various stories um, can, can help realize in the world? Um, and how can you do it? How can you work this way um, in ways uh, that help create that change, um, sp specifically um, do not uh, interrupt or get in the way of journalism ethics or maintaining editorial independence. Um, the first of those initiatives is something called the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium, uh, also called the GAC. Uh, this is something that I personally had the opportunity to help um, get off the ground working with Drew and others back in 2016. It's now um, been around for about five years. Um, and this is a global partnership between OCCRP's global network of investigative journalists and Transparency International's global network of anti-corruption advocates with more than 100 chapters in countries around the world. Um, this GAC really got off the ground in the first place out of this recognition um, that those perpetuating corruption, um, those on the other side of the equation, if you will, have no qualms about working together. Um, the world's most corrupt officials, organized criminal networks, they are highly organized. Um, on the other hand, investigative journalists, advocacy groups, um, there have been these traditional barriers to looking at how they can work together. Um, and there's also really distinct skill sets, uh, distinct capacities and competencies. Um, journalists who exist and work, um, the role and the purpose is to tell the story, um, to put the information out there, uh, and then to stop. Whereas advocates uh, can take that information, they can package it in ways uh, and really press for change. So our panel here today, um, what's cool about this group, I think, in front of you is that we are all actually partners uh, across OCCRP, Transparency International, um, and another initiative called the Anti-Corruption Data Collective, um, which Frederick will also tell us a little bit about today. Um, Drew and Frederick have worked together on global, huge cross-border collaborations. Um, OCCRP and TI have pioneered this GAC model, um, and uh, <laughs> certain members, um, who unfortunately were part of, are supposed to be part of our panel today but can't be, um, is also across, across both the ACDC and GAC. Um, to quickly introduce the panel, to my right is Drew Sullivan, who is the co-founder uh, and publisher of OCCRP. Um, to my left is uh, Andrea Roca, um, who is here with us, uh, standing in for Myra Martini, who's sitting up here on the front row. Uh, we were really looking forward to have Myra on the panel. She is um, a illicit flows expert at Transparency International and also on the steering committee of ACDC. Uh, Myra has unfortunately lost her voice today, uh, so we are lucky to have Andrea here to my left, who is a strategic partnerships manager and works on the GAC um, for TI. Uh, we didn't intend for this to be a mantle. Uh, further to the left um, is Frederick Obermeyer, um, who some of you may know um, is an investigative journalist with Der Spiegel and was also one of two journalists to receive the original leaks behind the Panama Papers. Um, he was a leader on that project, uh, also on Pandora Papers and the Swiss Secrets with Drew and others. Um, and uh, Frederick is a co-founder of ACDC. So with that, to kick us off, I think I'll turn first to Drew um, and just ask you, as a longtime investigative journalist, what was it in your work um, that really pushed you to, to try and, and think about giving this new way of working a shot in the first place? Right. So, you know, I started off as a, an American journalist and, you know, in, in America, you know, um, they love these kind of firewalls between everything. And, you know, journalists always, 
the, the, the word was you don't work with activists, they're gonna corrupt your journalism, they're gonna make you say things you don't wanna say, um, stay away from them, they've got you know, an idea on how the world should work. Um, and and that's, that's how I grew up in journalism. You know, but then I, I moved to Eastern Europe and I started working in you know, illiberal um, countries where crime and corruption were really quite severe, autocratic regimes and other places. And what I realized is the world was changing really quickly and you know, pure, um, uh, you know, pure ethics are really the, uh, the, the it, 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 it's something that only really works in countries that are functioning. Um, and you need, to, you need to think outside of the box and do things differently. And really, to fight corruption, there's really four kind of pillars. There's kind of the people who expose it, the civil society organizations and investigative reporters. And then there's the activists who really make it an issue and push for change. And then there's law enforcement, which you know, arrests people and, and does things. And then you have kind of the policy people who put new laws in government. And, and, and those work in, in many countries, but they don't work in other countries. And why hamstring yourself by not communicating between those groups you know, when we all agree that you know, we're trying to, to, to stop corruption? And so it's, it's what we, we thought of is we have to do something different. It's not working what we're doing. We have to try something different. Um, and so we, we said, let's experiment. And so we, we got a grant to, to see if we could make this work. And you know, four years later, um, uh, you know, we, we studied this grant and looked at it. And what we found out, it, well, actually, an independent organization came in and looked at our work and said, actually, you're, you're five times more likely to get impact when you work together. And that was stunning because <laughs> it's a hard thing to get impact in the places that we live and work. And so when, when something actually works, um, you know, it, it's quite amazing. And we found that all these issues of, you know, worrying about, you know, um, uh, um, being influenced by other people were really, you know, if, if you have good methods and, and good operations and do things carefully, you, tr you trust your partner, you communicate carefully, you don't have those kind of ethical dilemmas that you would expect that you have. It's actually worked out much better than we expected. And so we're, we're big proponents of it, and, and we want to have more media and more organizations join us. Great. Uh, Andrea, maybe I'll turn to you. Um, just sort of breaking it down, you know, what in practice has having this partnership with OCCRP and access to that reporting, what difference has that made for the kind of advocacy work that you guys, you and your colleagues do over at TI? Yeah. Hi, everyone. And uh, I suppose maybe I say uh, what we try to achieve on, in, in relation to corruption, and it's really uh, through this project, uh, um, the mic, <coughs> um, uh, holding people accountable. Uh, and also disrupting the systems uh, and the tools that are used uh, to perpetuate uh, to perpetuate corruption, and in particular cross-border uh, grand corruption. And effectively, when uh, uh, the Panama Papers were first released in 2016, uh, we realized that there was a, um, a huge opportunity there, but uh, if we had been better prepared, we, we could have used that to have uh, a better impact. And this is really what the GAC allow us, uh, allow us to do. Uh, so certainly one, one benefit on our side is the information sharing, and the, uh, uh, this, which is only possible when there is a trust, of course, between the two sides, also understanding of the different dynamics and the different ways in which the two sides uh, work. So while we are in a partnership, we are also very mindful that our advocacy is completely independent. We decide which stories we can follow up, and what are our priorities there, and equally, of course, on the investigation side, uh, journalists work completely uh, independently. Um, the, uh, but it's not just how to use the stories uh, for follow-up and how to use it for legal accountability and, uh, and to address policy issues or normative change, but I feel that this really helps us also contribute into investigations. I think uh, uh, civil society organizations have a lot of uh, expertise, certainly we have a lot of expertise in anti-corruption issues and we can support journalists sometimes in making sense of uh, data that they may have, information that they may have, and co contextualizing as well that information. And in a way, this contributes uh, eventually to more robust investigations that can help us uh, uh, more. And I'll give maybe one example. There was a recent uh, Open Looks uh, uh, work around the data from the Luxembourg uh, Beneficial Ownership Register, 
together, they were scraped uh, and, and analyzed, uh, and it was because of this collaboration before uh, uh, the publication, going through the data, that we were able to uh, highlight and pinpoint uh, two main flows, two main issues there. Uh, one, the role of uh, investment funds, and uh, they had been uh, perhaps a bit overlooked until then in perpetuating uh, 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 corruption and the money laundering risk that that posed, but also, crucially, the quality of the information and issues around verification of the data that is included in uh, human official ownership um, registers. And, uh, um, I, and also, may, if I add the last point, uh, is really maybe an internal issue in, in the TI movement. As, as Camille said, we are a diverse movement of 100 different chapters, 100 independent organizations, and not all of them are, uh, um, I suppose, uh, either able to do investigations or even uh, keen to this approach of using uh, cases uh, to, uh, to advocate for change and do different type of work. So the partnership also helped us spearheading case-based advocacy as an approach within, within the movement and mag maximizing the impact uh, that uh, the publication of a story has uh, to affect change. Great. Um, so over to you, Frederick. Um, given your work on the Panama Papers, right, this was a huge groundbreaking explosive investigation, huge for raising public awareness around financial crime. Um, even, you know, having done that work in the aftermath of that, I think it was 2019, um, what pushed you to think about getting ACDC off the ground? Um, and maybe if you could tell us a little bit about how it works and why you guys chose to focus specifically on the data piece of it. Well, basically it came out of an assessment of the missed opportunities. Um, when we spoke, spoke about the aftermath of the Panama Papers, mm -hmm. we realized that there is a lot of lost opportunities. Mm -hmm. We missed them. The, the one was we approached civil society groups like Transparency International beforehand, asked their expert for their expertise, but still we were like, we can't tell you anything. <laughs> but there is something that just in theory, if this company A does company, uh, mix something with company B, and if there's a sh nominee shareholder, what would you think? What is your theoretical um, assessment <laughs> of it? And we were like, just let's imagine what could have happened if we, for example, would simply have signed an NDA. That's like the lowest uh, thing to do. Like, and then presenting them the real um, proof that we had in front of us. And then like not speaking theoretically, but in practice. But then let's even like imagine what would could have happened if we had like involved them beforehand. Oh, sorry, I'm not used to microphones. I'm a print journalist. Sorry for that one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was basically the one part. And Gak, in my opinion, filled that that field. They already assessed that lack of opportunities and found a solution. But the other thing is that after the Panama Papers, it was dozens, if not hundreds, of uh, scholars and academics reaching out to us and like asking, hey, you have 2.6 of terabyte of data <laughs> out of a world that nobody knows of, like the secrecy world. Um, and we, as academics, we have time, we want to investigate it um, because we think that can bring change for society but it also helps future journalists like to learn um, from what is seeing structures for example we focused on cases but on some structures that are of public interest but not on everything and they were like just let's imagine us having access to it and at that point in time we had those discussions um, we made i worked at that point uh, for Süddeutsche Zeitung um, still we made the decision like not sharing the data with academics one reason was uh, source protection but that was basically the starting point like l what let's imagine like having journalists activists like experts i think activists is sometimes like a little bit flawed so it's like it's experts let's face the facts if we speak with transparency international we are not speaking uh, in first line with uh, activists, we are speaking with experts who have worked for years in this field. So, and then let's imagine, like, let's bring programmers in, let's bring academics in. And that is basically the idea of ACDC, uh, the Anti-Corruption Data Collective, like bringing those groups together, building trust, and let's work together on long-term investigations. So that's basically the, we realized it will not work like on like specific cases. It's like not, useful like to say like hey i'm frederick i'm working on this part would you as professor x epsilon like join here it's like rather let's focus a field and let's build a relationship because this is all about trust you cannot say like in general journalists can work with activists no not at all i would say some journalists can work with some civil society activists um 
but only if there's a trusted relationship. And we wanted to build this relationship, so we, and if I speak about we, that's uh, Myra sitting here in the front, unfortunately um, not being able to speak here. It's David Zaccone, a professor of the George Washington University, and Zoe Reiter, who was formerly with Transparency International, but is now with Pogo. And we thought we want to identify fields. One is real estate ownership, the other is private investment funds, and we want to evaluate together what can we do? Is there data sets that we can explore, that academics, as well as journalists, as well as, for example, TI could use? Is there fields where um, academics could basically use journalistic research to build on that? And that works. It was a slow process. This is not something like you can start like this and the next day you have an investigation. But see the, the last weeks. We had so many investigations on Russian oligarchs building on what ACDC has done in the past. We have Washington Post covering it, CNN, New York Times. We've worked with OCCRP on the Russian asset track and were able to um, um, help a little bit on that one. And I think that's what we are, want to create. We want to create a community building on trust where we can work together and where we don't have to rely only on NDAs or on like we publish something and later we can maybe speak a lot about things. I just want to hop in to ask you with that, given it's a newer initiative, what have you found to be the key challenges in doing that? Um, you know, you've acknowledged it's not something that happens overnight. I think we'd agree with that, you know, from the OCCRP and TI side as well. But what would you identify as something that you've had to proactively work through, you know, after having taken this decision to, to work like this? One thing is, again, trust, uh, to build trust. And that's always so simple. You can, like, hey, let's build trust. No, this is really, this takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of, uh, like, conversations and sp trying to understand the other side. But especially that, like understanding cultural differences. Journalists work differently than uh, scholars mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. activists. Especially the academic side is something where I think there's huge potential out there. Mm -hmm. But you have to explain professors how journalists mm -hmm. work. Like what is, if a professor understands something or explores a data set, what is interesting for a journalist? what brings a journalist to pick up this research. This is something that is a process. Um, and for example, Michael sitting here in the front row as well, he is, uh, that's Michael Hornsby, um, he's cr uh, focusing a lot on basically filling these gaps and creating understanding of this is what journalists do, this is what academics do, this is what activists do, like translating. Um, Drew, coming back to you, what about you know on behalf of OCCRP with journalists all over the world, uh, a number in dangerous places. Um, what have you found to be the greatest challenges? Um, what are some ways that you have over the years uh, managed working through them? And specifically, you know, how have you been able to uphold uh, the integrity of OCCRP's reporting? Right. Um, I mean, what, one of the challenges has been, you know, some some uh, well-known organizations um, in in the media space have been critical of the work that we're doing. Um, they've, they've openly said at, con at conferences it's unethical to do this kind of work. So there has been some kind of pushback from you know, what you'd expect from traditional media. Um, uh, in the field, the, the challenges are much different. You know, a lot of it has to do with, you know, um, as we adopted this, when we first adopted this four years ago, um, not even everybody in OCCRP was necessarily on board at first. And so we had to kind of explain it and educate our journalists on what was happening. Some journalists took to it a little too quickly. <laughs> they were, you know, willing to share everything, and uh, you know, we had to kind of back them off a little bit. Others, you know, won't share at all. We had to, you know, get them to to move forward. Eventually, we found the proponents, you know, in the organization who really pushed it. You know, Paul Radu, who's in the back, is is the co-founder of OCCRP with me. The fact that both of us stood up and said. We really want to do this. We really want to try to make this work. I think helped a little bit. Uh, we have excellent partner organizations um, that jumped on, but you know, there's always logistical problems. You know, in 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 one country, the uh, TI office doesn't like the the particular reporter, or vice versa, and won't talk to them. And uh, you know, those kind of things uh, happen all the time. Um, and so you got to kind of work around those. Um, but I mean, it's it's you know, one of the things that's you, you take advantage where you can, you know, it, it's a matter of, you know, um, uh, you know, you, you, you take an opportunity if it's there, if it's not there, then you, you, you know, you miss that opportunity, but next time you, you go. And I think what we found is that, you know, uh, TI sometimes wants to work 
you know, beyond OCCRP's capacity, and OCCRP wants to work in other areas of activism that TI may not work in. And I think that that's, you know, it, it's matching up those types of things. But, you know, OCCRP was, was you know, a, an early practitioner of collaborative cross-border investigative reporting. And so we lived in the world where we communicated and we worked with people of a very different cultures, working in different languages. Um, and so we became pretty good at kind of working in this collaborative space. And so I think that helped a lot. I think it's going to be harder for organizations that are much kind of tr more traditional. You know, the New York Times will, this will be really difficult for them to ever try to do this. But, but for, for people like Sudaicha Zeitung and, and um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, the Obermeyer twins, you know, um, the, uh, you know they, they, they're early adopters. And as you find more and more early adopters, you can build those kind of networks and teams to, 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 to be far more effective. And that's what we've been learning how to be far more effective. I want to turn back to Andrea, but just a quick administrative note, since we're not able to do the Q&A um, actively in person here. For anyone who has questions, please um, send them directly to me on Twitter. Um, please send me a direct message, at Camille Ice, first name, last name, on Twitter. Um, and we'll leave some, uh, some time at the end to take, take all your questions that way. So send them in, and I'll um, share them in a few minutes. Uh, over to you, Andrea. Um, you talked a lot about you know, what this kind of partnership allows you to do. Um, what makes it you know, hard work on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, and what are some of the challenges that you guys have faced um, that, that makes a difference with whether you can really do something with this? There's, uh, there's certainly many. I mean, it's, it's a work in progress, no? And, and there's constantly, you, you talk about trust and how long it takes, but also understanding uh, how each other works is, uh, is, uh, is something <laughs> that takes maybe even, even longer, no? And, and how to reconcile certain differences. And certainly one of the challenges for us is, uh, is uh, um, how, how early in advance we can know about a story. Mm -hmm. uh, there are sometimes the whispering, as, uh, as, as you said, uh, uh, Friedrich, but uh, there are sometimes limitations, especially when an investigation is a collaborative one with many other media outlets that may have a different, uh, a different approach. At the same time, for us, uh, how long we have uh, in advance to prepare is, is absolutely key. Uh, key. We have really seen that uh, uh, the window of opportunity sometimes is, is fairly, fairly short, it's fairly small. And uh, if it is an area where we've been already working for long, uh, we would have already a policy position. We know what we are doing, and it's easier, I suppose, to take the opportunity. Uh, there are also some investigations that highlight new areas uh, where we may have to develop a policy position, and that takes time. So if we don't have that, uh, that time to prepare, then that affect uh, uh, what we can deliver, what we can do, and therefore the impact uh, uh, that we can have. Um, and I suppose uh, in relation to this, uh, uh, you know, to give a flavor of some uh, of the other challenges, one is also the, uh, um, how long it takes to achieve impact. No? I mean, the story is out there. However, it doesn't mean that uh, a story is enough uh, for us. Uh, there are countless examples where it takes effectively years to create change that we can really put out there as, uh, uh, as an example of strong impact. We've been working uh, since uh, 2017 on the golden visas, uh, so-called no? the investment by uh, citizenship or residency by investment schemes, and uh, uh, the, the early stories were around that, but it is only really now that there has been a very strong movement at the EU level to, uh, uh, to ban them, and it took, uh, it took effectively four years of, uh, um, of, of work on that. Um, just to follow up on that, can you talk a little bit about what it means for the legal accountability part of all of this, um, and some of the, the issues that crop up there? Yeah, you're absolutely. pushing for sanctions or actual criminal cases. Yeah, that, that is, I think, a key area where the partnership has clear benefits. No? Journalists can't uh, uh, give the information to or be in touch and collaborate with law enforcement. There are clear limitations there. Civil society does not, uh, does not have. And, uh, and we certainly try and use investigations uh, uh, to push for criminal, journalistic investigations to push for criminal investigations by law enforcement. Uh, obviously, when you are dealing with countries where there is no rule of law or huge issues there, you know that uh, there can't be any movement in the particular country, and this is where we try and see what are the jurisdictions. If there is a cross-border investigation and there is a cross-border angle, what are the jurisdictions we can try and, uh, and use, but also what, what alternative ways. No? So I think for us, criminal accountability and criminal investigation are the ideal. We want to get there. Sometimes you can't certainly use in sanctions, like the global Magnitsky uh, uh, system in the, in the US, in the UK now, and, uh, and within Europe is, uh, is also one 
one, one important tool. However, and this again is how we work differently. No, you can have a leak that you can use uh, as journalists to put out your story, mm -hmm. and law enforcement can't necessarily use the same documents depending on how they have, they've been obtained. They may not be usable in a court of law. And there's another example of limitations that, uh, that affects also the, the impact that we can have on the legal accountability side. Um, so we've talked a lot about, you know, in in theory and in practice, what does this mean? But what are some of the examples, right? What kind of change um, have these kind of partnerships actually resulted in in the world? And I'll, I'll turn back to you, Drew, first to say, you know, what do you think is the greatest success you've seen out of working with TI or that one of your, uh, you know, one of the journalists across OCCRP would say, hey, this really made a difference for my story? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of examples. I mean, um, what comes to mind is, you know, um, we did a project in, um, in in the Gambia where we looked at uh, uh, Yaya Jama, who was the uh, you know two decade long autocratic ruler of, of the country, and um, um, you know he fell, and journalists started really looking at where all the assets went, and so you know the beauty of having somebody who takes your stuff and then f you know files a suspicious you know wealth order or you know magnitsky filing or something like that is really really cool because that gives you the effect and and so um he had properties that were um that were seized in the united states uh, after that because of the work of of um the, the fine folks at ti and then the Azerbaijani laundromat is another good example. You know, that was a big project where we looked at a, um, a, a floating um, uh, virtual money laundering machine that was being operated out of Russia and Estonia and um, Azerbaijan and Lithuania and other places. And um, a large number of the assets um, were, were moving into, um, uh, from the Azerbaijani government into Europe that was used to bribe uh, members of the uh, Council of Europe and other places. And so uh, we were able to prove in the story the bribes, but just because you can prove a bribe doesn't mean things happen. And it was, you know, TI can talk a little bit more about it, but how they did this, but, you know, they were able to really put pressure, you know, on, on the political system um, to, to really make change, and there was change um, in the Council of Europe. Uh, yeah, picking up on that, so you mentioned earlier, Andrea, that the impact coming out of this, you know, it can take years. Um, so I think the Azerbaijani laundromat is actually a really interesting example in that, um, you know, TI was there. They were at the door of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Uh, with these findings, um, people resigned uh, because of how they were called out um, in these findings, the, the council launched an official, official investigation. Um, but something that's pretty cool about the Azerbaijani laundromat is that we've continued to see this kind of impact. Um, years later, uh, there's been the introduction, you know, of new legislation in the UK and otherwise. otherwise. Um, but Andrea, can you really talk to us just a little bit more about how that works, what that means? Um, and even, you know, just even about a feedback loop in terms of once this data is out there, how it feeds into other projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just to say, the Azerbaijani laundromat had clearly the, that impact at the Council of Europe. There were also criminal investigations in a number of countries uh, of origin of the members of the Parliamentary Assembly. In, in Germany, there is still one that remains open. Uh, there was a trial in, in Italy. However, we were able to, to achieve success. There was also an independent panel that reviewed what happened and issued recommendations. But still, the Council of Europe has not uh, worked on another of our key recommendations, which is to create a permanent investigative body to, uh, um, that can effectively prevent this from happening again. So there was an investigation, there was a report about that particular instance. Is now the Council of Europe stronger to prevent this from reoccurring? Uh, not yet. So indeed, indeed, long work. But the other, I think, uh, good example of how uh, uh, you know a, a good investigation and, 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 and a wide range of investigation like that continues to be helpful, I think, is uh, the developments that are happening in relation to uh, uh, anti-money laundering supervision in Europe. Uh, one of the key uh, issues that uh, the Azerbaijan Laundroba highlighted really was the weakness within the EU of money laundering supervision. Um, in, in Denmark, which was one of the key countries there, Danske Bank was one of the banks involved, and there were only seven people in Denmark 
Denmark uh, in the government uh, that effectively had uh, uh, as, a, as a task the supervision of uh, an oversight of the banking system. And this was certainly one of the issues that, uh, that allowed the situation to happen. And uh, uh, with this and with other stories that continue to highlight flaws, uh, we, have, we have continued to work on for a, uh, and, and to call for a EU-wide uh, system uh, to, uh, to strengthen money laundering supervision. And finally, uh, now effectively last year, in July last year, the European Union has issued a, a proposal to establish a, a, EU, a new EU authority, a supervisory authority of the banking system that would have uh, effectively two mandates, uh, supervise the national supervisory authorities, but also with powers, uh, hopefully if this is approved by Parliament and by the EU Council, uh, of direct supervisions uh, of banks that are particularly high risk. So the investigation now, the laundromat is already uh, how many of uh, almost six years uh, old, and yet we can still use to uh, use it, I suppose, to, uh, uh, to advance on, our, on these other priorities. Just one quick thing to add to this. You know, the, the other element that goes that comes into play here is that a lot of these are large projects that include many, many news organizations, which kind of whips up a political furor around a particular topic. You know, so when these big projects come out and there's 40 or 50 or 100 news organizations in it, it really creates a compelling uh, force to, to, for change. And I think that really helps TI in the process because it, it gives you know them political coverage. It gives the politicians who are involved in it the political coverage they need. And it just seems that when these big projects come out, they're far more effective at really creating change uh, right now. Let's hope that keeps happening. Uh, Frederick, turning back to you, um, what about you in terms of you know a favorite success that's come out of ACDC? Um, has there been work, you know, you mentioned these thematic areas that you guys are working on collaboratively. Um, is there results that you have seen, progress that you have seen, you know, that you might compare with sort of that frustration you felt after the Panama Papers um, and the limits that you saw around that? First and foremost, as you already mentioned, there's a Bajani laundromat. That's an amazing example because we still see, like, I'm coming from the south of Germany, which is maybe in comparison to other countries similar, it's the, I would consider it the more corrupt part of Germany. Um, so we do see an investigation still into this particular um, alleged crime. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's important because I think without um, Transparency International, without this bigger group of journalists still focusing, still following up, I think this investigation um, would have died down already. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge thing. Um, when speaking about ACDC, I think it's a, especially in those times, um, we have the time for ACDC because now everyone all around the world, law enforcement, activists, journalists are tracing assets. And of course, we worked on assets, we worked on real estate, we worked on private investment funds. Where is the Russian money? Where do Russian oligarchs invest? Which Russian oligarchs do, for example, help uh, in philanthropic foundations in the US. This is something this was laid open. Mm -hmm. My colleague David Sacconi and uh, Florian Hollenbach, a professor uh, in Copenhagen, they have told me like the past 10 months already, it's like, there's a database and nobody's taking care. No journalist is interested in it at all. And we were like knocking at doors on, on newspapers, like in newsroom, like there's a database. You only have to look into it. We, I mean, they even have a nice Excel spreadsheet. I'm not good in Excel right. spreadsheets, but even I can work with that one. And there was not that much interest. And now, the Ukraine war, everybody's interested. Um, and I think there you can see, like, building up those relationships, this was a missed opportunity for many newsrooms um, mm -hmm. because the data was out there already. You could have done it before. And speaking about time, I think we all have to realize this is all a long-term effort. We have just last week seen a raid in Eastern Germany based on Panama Papers um, data. That was Panama Papers, uh, old story, that was six years ago. Um, so you see how slow things work on the law enforcement side, and I think what journalists, what activists, and what academia are currently doing is like speeding up, getting faster, yeah. and my personal hope is that law enforcement finds a way of like, not keeping up, because <coughs> I think that's unrealistic, but getting <laughs> closer to it. We're still using Panama so, Papers, by the way, yeah. so even the journalists are yeah. sometimes slow. Drew, I might turn back to you just on this issue of law enforcement. Um, in terms of, you know, we talked about sort of these, these different anti-corruption actors working, you know, with these barriers between them uh, and the relationship between journalists and law enforcement, uh, it's a complicated one. 
Um, but, you know, the desired effect of putting a lot of this information out there, you know, is that official action will be taken. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about how OCCRP works with law enforcement or at least how you've seen the value of that reporting um, when it comes uh, to official action. So, so the problem we have with law enforcement is, you know, we cover them. <laughs> you know, we try to hold them accountable. We're constantly looking at them. Um, you know, it, 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 it's something we, you know, that, that's an issue. So it's difficult to cover somebody and also cooperate with them. You know, we talk to law enforcement all the time. Um, you know, they're, they're sources for us. You know, some of us, you know, are sources for them sometimes. There's communication that goes on. But we really do have to keep, you know, a, a, um, you know, a separation. And we, we can't really help law enforcement, you know, directly um, you know, in, in some senses. So, you know, we, we, we don't, we can't give information to law enforcement, um, but we can send them to partners such as, you know, TI, because TI can work with law enforcement. They work with law enforcement all the time. And so consequently, you know, it's a way that the communication gets there. You know, in the old days, things worked, but journalists did their story, and then they never shared with anybody. And then civil society would say, great issue, we're going to look at this, and then they don't share it with anybody. And then law enforcement says, we're going to start subpoenaing people, and they don't share it with anybody, you know. And policymakers say, oh, this, we really need to change the law, and they don't have any of the information, you know. We, we have to kind of break down those barriers, um, and, you know, we can't always do it directly. Um, you know, when law enforcement comes to us, we don't help them. You know, we got we got to talk to organized crime people, too, if they think – we're helping law enforcement, you know, that's a safety issue for us. But, you know, if policy people and if the activists and others can work with law enforcement and they have access to some of the information and they've worked on these stories and they've lended their investigative capacity, the fastest area of growth of investigative capacity is not in investigative reporting, it's in civil society organizations, you know, which are forming in great numbers and are, you know, organizations like Bellingcat is a good example you know, they're not a traditional journalism organization. They're, they're an activist organization that does information. Um, and so there's all these new hybrids coming out, and some of them can communicate and some of them can't. But if we share, then in the end, the information gets to where it needs to get to. People can keep their ethical standards, and, and the world benefits. And so that's kind of our philosophy on it. Just to add, um, the way a well, excuse me. <laughs> Uh, the way law enforcement works, they have to do their own investigation, right? It needs to be an official investigation. But the fact that these stories are out there in the first place um, is all the more reason, and, and they have leads, right, to go do this work in the first place. So they know the answer, and now they just have to do the investigation to get it. Um, but they see, <laughs> they've seen the documents, which are printed in our stories, or they're in the reports by TI. And so it makes it a lot easier for them to, to move and actually move quickly because they can have that, that kind of um, uh, information that, that leads them to believe this is happening, which means they can arrest people. We also uh, at OCCRP talk a lot about how corruption is inherently cross-border. Um, and by nature, law enforcement needs to stop at the border, whereas our investigative journalism network uh, and a number of you out here in the room um, you can cross borders, you can move more quickly, you can get information from trusted partners. Um, so I have some questions coming in, but wanna encourage you out there, if you have anything, please again, sorry that we have to do this, but send them to me on Twitter. Uh, it's at Camille Ice. Um, I'm gonna take the first question that's come in, which is an interesting one, um, probably for you, Drew, but I'll turn to others. As a freelance writer pitching long form features to major US news orgs, I find editors need a lot of reasons to say yes, but only one reason to say no. What's been the effect of this partnership with TI on your partnerships with news organizations? Well, I mean, I think um, it's difficult for freelancers to be investigative reporters. You're kind of unicorns anyway. Um, it's a really difficult thing. I mean, I think, I think we're completely open to, to any story that comes in. So we're a lot different from traditional news organizations. All our stories come from you know, either partner organizations or, you know, uh, uh, wor working journalists. Um, and so it's fairly easy. We, ha we do a lot of work with freelancers who do a lot of different stories. I think the traditional news organizations are the ones that are missing out a little bit here. Um, and, you know, the other thing is that, that you know, partnerships, 
you know, a lot of freelancers work in other areas. They don't just work in journalism. They, they do reports sometimes for civil society organizations. You know, they do editing for these types of organizations. So there's just a lot more avenues, I think, in kind of these collaborative spaces um, uh, to do more work um, and to work together. Um, am I answering the question? Um, I'm sort of wondering, though, like, you, you, you do an investigation, and then you go to the Washington Post, and you say, hey, we have all this awesome stuff. We want to write a story about it. Are they now saying, eh, uh, you're too activist-y? So, well, so, some do, yeah. I mean, <laughs> even in the Washington Post, if, if you go to Jeff Lean, the investigative director, editor, you know, he might say, eh, you're too activist-y. But if you go to, you know, uh, somebody else there, they're going to say, they're, they're all going through this change now, too. Um, they're all facing this, and, and they've handled it really, really badly, um, uh, to, to be honest. So um, I think they um, are starting to realize that they need to leverage other people's skills and abilities, especially, you know, Washington Post a couple months ago announced they were going to, you know, a after many years ago dropping their international network, they were going to send people out as correspondents around the world, which is stupid. You know, I mean, it's just stupid. There are so many organizations out there that are better, cheaper, faster, and you got to build relationships with them. Um, because, you know, the reporters, uh, you know, our reporters in Hungary, you know, are, are much better than anybody the Washington Post can send there because they, they know things. So you, you have to kind of embrace this collaboration. You have to embrace the fact that things are different. You have to embrace the fact that the rules have changed uh, in the world. Um, and you can still do it ethically and to the standard that you want because the systems are open. You know, you, you, we share information, but you go back and you write your own story. Um, so, so, you know, I think it's, they're the ones, the, the American organizations are the worst um, because, yeah, they're, they're very competitive still. You know, they, they see this as kind of the stories as zero sum gains, you know, and, and I think that the Europeans are much more smarter on this. Uh, and are, are, have, have really adopted this to a much better extent. And I think that the Americans will eventually come around to it, because if they don't, they will, they will lose out. Um, they've al already lost out. Uh, most of the gigantic, huge collaborative stories that have gone in the world have been in Europe. They've not been in America. You know, America has been losing out. I'll turn over uh, to you, Frederick, to add to that in terms of, you know, from the European perspective. Um, you know, how has this new way of working for you, has it affected your relationship with news organizations at all? I think the most important thing is that we have to face realities. Um, if you work in those international collaboration, it would be na collaborations, it would be naive to think that even if you believe in this strict Chinese wall way of working, that civil society organizations wouldn't realize that there's an investigation going on. Especially, let's imagine an investigation about illicit money flows. That's what I've done in the past. It's like if you work with 100 reporters all around the world uh, on those topics, everyone has his or her experts, and most of them are then, for example, sitting at Global Witness, uh, Transparency International, and they're calling them. And if six or seven reporters are calling at Transparency International asking the same questions, hey, let's face realities. Transparency would smell the red anyway so that there's something going on and if there's so many reporters asking exactly the same questions. So you could, I think there's a way and a, a huge advantage in being a little bit more upfront because then anyway, let's, I mean, there are strict ways of still like keeping the distance. We would never in, be in, or, or for example, if we work with a uh, expert of, with Transparency International, we would never allow this to be an interference in our editorial policy or journalistic freedom. This is like off limits, and if they would try, we were like, hey, stop it, um, there's the door, but it doesn't happen. I mean, I think both sides can profit from it while keeping your independence. Because on the other way around, I wouldn't give recommendations to uh, Transparency International of how they should do policy work. Mm -hmm. That's their business, that's what they do, but that's not my business. Great. Um, so another question, um, a practical one. Uh, how do the partnerships work regarding resources and financing? Do NGOs and media outlets share expenses, and who decides who has to bring in what resources um, other than man, woman, power? Uh, this is a great question, um, and I think uh, Andrea and I can both. Yeah, go ahead. Um, 
It depends, I suppose. That's, that's the bottom line. Uh, um, I think uh, certainly uh, I see ourselves as more effective when we go together as well, because what we are selling is a partnership. What we are selling is these uh, these synergies that can maximize impact. So I think we are we are more successful if we if we go with uh, this concept and uh, um, and try and, and re mobilize resources on on the basis rather than us going uh, on corruption issues, saying that we work with journalists, but you know how that is done or no, what, what do they see? And, uh, and equally, you going, uh, the, the journalists going separately. That is obviously only possible if there is uh, a, uh, I suppose, uh, a, a long-term partnership as, as GAC. Uh, a lot of the collaborations that happen are also ad hoc. No? We, we don't work only with you, we don't work only with you. We work with a variety of our journalists and equally, uh, you work with, uh, and you are in touch with a number of NGOs. Uh, so that, that there are obviously limitations to that. Uh, but I'll mention maybe something else, which uh, um, I think is, uh, uh, is really helping in strengthening capacity, which is the fact that you don't uh, always need uh, money. Uh, right to collaborate and to strengthen impact. Uh, one of the things that we are trying to do to build a stronger legal accountability work using these investigations is, uh, is exploring better synergies also within civil society organizations, where I think there is not this fear of collaboration. No? I think if there is in terms of learning, well, certainly civil society can, uh, can teach, so to say, to others is, uh, is how to work together because it's really the, the tradition and the norm in, uh, in the sector. Uh, but we are uh, discussing with, say, human rights groups or environmental groups that may have specific cases or may be interested in your investigations uh, to see how we can build a stronger case. Um, I come in fact from the human rights sector uh, and uh, in, in a number of cases of uh, say indigenous communities fighting against uh, big development projects in relation to evictions and human rights violations, there is always a corruption angle. Now, typically, the human rights NGO that is supporting uh, that case from the human rights angle has no capacity to build uh, the corruption-related angle. Uh, so he, he, another example where the synergies and bringing together groups, even without resources, our keeping uh, ours and, and the other group keeping theirs, uh, can lead to, uh, uh, to good collaboration and, uh, and, uh, and stronger results. Um, I would just add on the financing piece of it that um, the collaboration is, you know, the focus of our, our talk today and the focus of our partnership with TI, but working in this way, um, you know, it doesn't mean that you're not doing the core work that each of these organizations do on their own, right? Um, so for OCCRP, our fundamental mission is exposing crime and corruption. It's doing that reporting. Um, it's being able to support our global network with all the services and data tools and um, digital security. Uh, trusted partners around the world, um, and you still need to go out and be able to raise resources for that core work. Um, and then at the same time, you can bring to that conversation that um, that in terms of, you know, we talk about our uh, metrics and impact um, in terms of increased accountability. That is our primary selling point at OCCRP, that more than 7.4 billion um, in illicitly acquired funds have been returned to the public sphere um, because of reporting, our reporting in, has contributed to those returns and those seizures. Um, that you know has to stand on its own as a message, but then we can go in and tell supporters, tell potential donors, that we're also open to working in this different way, that we see what activists and, and advocate groups, experts can do with these kinds of findings that journalists can't, that we recognize that reality, and we're gonna try something a little bit different. Um, we're gonna invest in this partnership with TI um, because we want those stories to go further than they could on their own. Um, and then when we present that together, uh, you know, a, a donor yesterday on, on a panel somewhere when asked about something related to this said, when I ask a journalist, you know, what's the work you're most proud of? What's the story you're most proud of? They always turn to something that resulted in something else, where someone was put away, there were bank fines, et cetera. Um, so I really think, you know, this message of what difference the work makes in the first place um, is what really resonates uh, in terms of building support for your work. Um, the fact that you're open-minded, you see the world that you're, that you're living in right now, um, but also donors recognize that resources are limited. Um, so I think they're open to the idea that, you know, you're going to take some of the pie, you can work out with your partners, um, what do you actually need to do to make this work? What kind of resources does that require? Um, and this actually uh, leads us into um, another question that we've received, which is just about the future of this kind of work. Um, and the future of this particular initiative. 
Um, turning here, uh, pointing back to your comment earlier, Drew, about TI and OCCRP looking, you know, to, to see how other organizations can be part of the GAC in particular, um, how maybe these two initiatives could collaborate going forward. Um, the question is, do you have any specific criteria or something that you're looking for? Um, you know, are you open to other organizations being part of this? Um, so I'll just kick this off um, in to, to let you guys know that we've actually done a good bit of work trying to think that, about this. Um, even these two organizations figuring out how to work together, you know, when you could share information, how do you keep people safe, um, what's the right entry point for asking questions and, and soliciting the expertise, right, of Myra and Andrea and other experts. Um, this took years, right, to figure out how to do this back and forth, but I would say with the GAC in particular, we've done a lot of work together with TI to really look at what you know, given our geographic coverage, given our substantive coverage, um, the themes, the issues that we look at, you know, where do we have some gaps? Where would it be helpful? What part of the world um, do we need partners? Where could we have local partners or even global partners um, that are covering other aspects of corruption? And the whole point of thinking about how we might scale this is just so that there can be more impact, so that more groups can do more with this kind of information. Um, resources is part, part of that equation, of course. We recognize um, what we're trying to do now is do more of this ad hoc collaboration, in part because it takes so long for these you know, groups to figure out what's in this, how is this aligned with my core mandate. Um, there is a lot of natural overlap at the same time. You know, as we work uh, to pull in some of those additional resources, we would love to see who could play um, key roles and fill some of these key gaps um, in a larger GAC. Um, I'll turn it over to you guys now, uh, maybe to talk a little bit about, you know, is ACDC sort of a locked initiative? Like these are the participants that are there right now. Um, I know we from the GAC side are looking forward to sharing notes on how we can pursue some of this together, but part of it, of course, is also having more media organizations um, to partner with, generating more investigative content that a wider group of NGOs um, can really use. Well, basically, ACDC is very open, so it's like whenever you want to work with us, reach out to us, um, but don't expect something ha to happen like within a week or so. It's like really communicating, can we find common ground, common projects. So for example, if you're interested in private investment funds, let us know because that's something where we are working on. If you're interested in real estate uh, ownership, reach out to us. We are currently like thinking about the next topics because now we have reached a level where we think we can uh, uh, evaluate or explore new grounds. If you have ideas, reach out to us. Uh, even like, I know this is a rather journalistic uh, audience, but if you know academics um, that are working in this field that might be interested in working with us, um, spread the word. Um, this is not a closed job. We really believe in collaborations not only among journalists, but really across all those different groups. Um, and we are happy to work with all of you. Can we just copy your so, answer? And no, <laughs> <be>? <laughs> yeah. no, I mean, I think certainly on our side is, is uh, you know, there, is, there are not the ethical issues, right, that, that we've been talking about. And, uh, and again, civil society, I think, there is a tradition of, of collaboration. So there is certainly uh, uh, interest and openness uh, in, uh, in working with, uh, with both with other NGOs uh, as well as with other uh, investigative outlets. Uh, and it is already happening, no? I mean, I, I mentioned uh, the, what we are trying to develop also with uh, synergies in the human rights sector, but uh, with several GAC of your investigations on the Mukula trade, for example, in, uh, in Africa of Rosewood, uh, uh, we've been working with uh, environmental groups to bring also this to uh, uh, the, the CITES, the Convention on Endangered Species. Uh, so there's, uh, yeah, certainly openness, uh, but the, the, the resource issues is, is, is obviously, I mean, there for everyone, no? There's no, there's no uh, doubt about it in terms of uh, capacity to respond, and, uh, and this is where we are hoping also that an expanded, uh, an expanded GAC can not, not only bring in others, but also support our own or increase our own capacity uh, as well as yours to, uh, um, to work on this. Mm, yeah. Great. I, I think well, one, one last thing about this is that I think where this is going in the future is actually beyond these groups into the public and, and really working with the public to get involved in this whole process as well. Um, you know, the, the, as information gets more difficult to get a hold of, you know, the public is, is has, you know, they run all these <laughs> autocracies and they run all these, 
you know, criminal networks and they run all these things. And so, you know, where we're going is in, in the fight against corruption is really bring everybody in, you know, to the fight against it. And I think we have to really think of ways, and we've started doing this at OCCRP, is how can you bring the public into this process? Because that's the ultimate final step um, uh, to bring them in. Um, I think we're going to get cut off here shortly, but we have one final question. I'll just throw it out really quickly. Um, in terms of, Drew had mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, a lot of our work uh, at OCCRP um, is in authoritarian or less dem democratic settings, whereas ACDC's work has focused more uh, in the U.S., in Luxembourg, um, and there's a question just about what's been the reaction from U.S. media policy uh, and others um, to working in this way in that environment. Well, basically, from our side, we are open to all those environments <laughs> um, because we really believe that it would be like, for example, as you mentioned, we are currently working a lot focusing on the global north. Of course, we want to do more on the global south, but it's by far more difficult from the academic side, from the journalistic side. It's like I know that working uh, circumstances there for journalists and for activists are by far tougher than we are uh, here in the north. Um, so this is something where we, that it, where we like aim for. Um, and again, if you have ideas, we are open for it um, and are happy to work in these environments. But um, speaking about um, autocratic countries, I think this is, for me, this is not too bold anymore. Um, it's like we see like the fingers of those regimes Absolutely. in all, nearly all Western countries as well. It would be naive to say like, oh, ACDC is focusing on in the US, so this is a Western country and their autocrats are somewhere else. It's like, hey, they're there as well. You, d you don't see them that open yeah. or let's say, Currently, I mean, in the past years, it was by far more open when it comes to autocratic tendencies. <laughs> Just the other part of that to close on um, is that, uh, you know, across these environments, I think what a lot of these investigations shows and why it's so critical to have partners both locally and globally that can follow up on these findings um, is because these are global stories, right? These are cases of domestic corruption or local corruption, but that are funneled through the Western financial system. Um, it is, you know, we talk about how we have to be global as an organization to follow the money um, because these money flows are moving around the world um, and it involves all kinds of environments uh, and it requires change um, in a number of countries, some deemed democratic um, and others less so. Uh, so on that note, um, we will wrap it up. Uh, thank you, everyone. And um, if I didn't get to your question, I apologize, but we'll be here for a few minutes. Thanks. Thank you.